Thank you. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Good morning. Uh, let me first introduce the panelists that you haven't seen yet. Uh, we're very pleased to have here both uh, Richard Omohundro and Andreas uh, Winmer. Uh, Omohundro, before knowing him and saying him, I said, is he, I mean, coming from Nigeria? What is his name coming from? I mean, looking at him, not obviously. Uh, Omohundro is a Basque name, in fact. And uh, uh, Richard uh, well, used to be a financial analyst, uh, was an investment manager, a very successful one, managed uh, a four and a half billion dollars uh, assets. So that means that when you talk about uh, money and successful business here, you have somebody who knows what he's talking about. But he decided to leave and he started the Carpenters Fund. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I mean, this is going to be part of his presentation. Now, something striking about him is that he did build his own airplane. This is already striking, but what strikes me more, is probably even more difficult, is that he did fly it. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, and, and he once had an important discussion and meeting with a taxi driver from Kenya, and he might allude to that discussion. We'll know more about that discussion later on. Uh, Andres Widmer uh, is a uh, Swiss citizen, but he's living in the United States of, of America. You've probably seen his, his size. I mean, you would understand that he was a, a Swiss guard at the Vatican from 1986 to 1988. I mean, this is the type of guard that you would want to have for yourself. Um, <laughs> now, he has had in the United States a very uh, successful um, uh, career as an entrepreneur in software. So he run uh, several companies that started from a very small size and, and grew up. So uh, again, here you will have somebody who is going to talk about his own uh, experience, but keep in mind that he is somebody who is capable of being a successful businessman, but he will speak about how to do a, a meaningful uh, business. Now I think that I, I should uh, remind all of us of the title of our uh, panel this morning, panel discussion, The Common Good to Serve the Human person. So let, let us first try and define the, the scope of our discussion. And here I'll do two things, in fact, play the, my role as, as, as a moderator, but at the same time make kind of an introductory statement. So please bear with me for, for a few seconds. Here I'm going to uh, make sure that we all remember that we have five uh, parameters for, for our discussion, but that indicates also the breadth and the scope of what we can discuss. The first one uh, is about the fundamental um, uh, guiding proposals of these Zermatt summits. You remember the first one, finance to serve the, the economy. Second, the economy to serve the common good. And the third one, the common good to serve the human person. And this is exactly where we are this morning, common good to serve the human person. So the ultimate person, concern is the human person, and we want to focus our discussion on this objective of serving the person. Second uh, parameter, it's, it's the, the longest one. The, the three uh, left will be much shorter. But it's about the notion of, of the common good. Uh, today, a number of people speak of the common good, but there is no clarity about the notion. Some uh, make confusion with the notion of public interest. You have in your booklets the difference I mean, that is explained, between, I mean, the difference between uh, public interest and common good. Public interest is there to determine the legitimacy or legality of the measures taken by the state. But of course, when it comes to the notion of the common good, it's much broader than just simply the role of the state. It's the responsibility of each actor in, in society. Of course, the role of society as, 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 uh, of the state uh, is, is an important one also. And you hear the expression common goods these days to address a totally different issue in, in, um, in plural common goods, like the water, for instance. But that's another discussion. This is about the status or, or nature of specific assets, like the water. I mean, so of course, water is part, an important element of the common good, but, but it's, we're not talking of the common good in, in, in that uh, uh, limited sense. Now, uh, common good. We, uh, uh, if you look for, for a definition, you will probably have some, some difficulty. Now we are here, gathered here, coming from different cultures. And I think that what we want to do is to search for the best of uh, the values that we have in our own uh, cultures. And uh, when it comes to the definition of the common good, it is generally recognized that uh, a lot of work has been done there in the Christian social teaching, and, and, and more specifically in uh, Catholic social 
teaching. So let, let me just simply read two or three uh, elements and I'm ready to give my sources to those of you who are interested la la later on. So here are some excerpts of important texts. In keeping with the social nature of man, the good of each individual is necessarily related to the common good, which in turn can be defined only in reference to the human person. So the starting point is the social nature of man. Now what is to be understood uh, by common good? By common good it is to be understood the sum of total social conditions which allow people either as groups or as individuals to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. So it's not an easy uh, uh, definition, but you see that it's about condition that will uh, ultimately serve the fulfillment uh, of uh, groups and individuals. So there are three components to this notion of uh, the common good. First one is the respect for the person. And the person in its entirety, that, that is to say the whole man, men and women, of course men in a broad sense, in a generic uh, sense. So we need to ad address the, the needs both of, of the body and of the soul. Second element is that the common good requires the social well-being and development of the group itself. So there's a need to make accessible to each what is needed to lead a truly human life, food, clothing, health, work, education, culture, suitable information, the right to establish a family, etc. And the third element, the common good requires peace, with the classical definition of peace, which is the stability and security of a just order. So back to justice. Now, each community has its own common good, the family, your corporation, the professional group you, you, you belong to. Uh, but it is in the political community that its most complete realization is found. It's the role of the state to defend and promote the common good of civil society, its citizens, and intermediate bodies. This is a text that, uh, that has already two or three uh, I mean decades of age. I think that these days we would definitely insist on the role of the private sector, on the, the social responsibility of, of uh, corporations. Of course, the role of the state is the most important one in that respect, but it's <coughs> not exclusive by far, not exclusive, and this is one of the purposes of these uh, uh, summits. And the common good these days has to be understood as, as a common good, of course, of each one of the communities I've addressed to, but we have to see it in the broader context. After all, we're talking globalization here. Human interdependence is increasing and gradually spreading throughout the world. The unity of the human family embracing people who enjoy equal natural dignity implies a universal common good. And this good calls for an organization of the community of nations able to provide for the different needs of men. So the, the main point I want to make here is that the common good is always oriented towards the progress of persons. The order of things must be subordinate to the order of persons and not the uh, other way around. Now quickly, third parameter for our discussion today. Uh, today's theme is, the overall theme for the day is justice justice and solidarity for sustainability. Now, as we know, justice and solidarity are values that are essential for the achievement of the common good. But I would submit that disrespect for these values uh, may bring short-term, even mid-term advantages, but it will inevitably lead to failure. So let's discuss how justice and solidarity make a system more sustainable in the interest of uh, individual human, human beings. So in the discussion later on, please, why, especially because it's the third day today, why wouldn't you share your own experiences as to how you disregarded uh, short-term or mid-term advantages 
for the sake of uh, justice and solidarity and made your own system more sustainable in the interest of persons who were entrusted uh, to you. Fourth parameter, of course, will be Hernando de Soto's theme, directly related, of course, to today's theme, which was fairness and justice in the economy. That will definitely be part of our discussion later on. Fifth and last parameter, this year's summit's general theme, servant leadership. So let us also, in our discussion, as much as possible, try to focus on the role of, of leaders. And please here again share experiences on how leadership exercised as a service contributes to making the common good serve the human person. Now, how are we going to, to proceed? First, I'm going to give a fair chance to uh, the panelists who have not spoken yet to uh, make their introductory statements. Uh, second, I think that we'll immediately go over to the discussion with you all, because uh, definitely, I'm, I mean, after these two first days, you certainly want to participate. And um, the, the panelists will also have a chance to react to each other's statements if they so wish. And at the end, I will give them an opportunity to make a, a concluding statement. Okay, this is where we are. And uh, now, as uh, we have agreed, we'll start with uh, Andreas. Can I give you the floor? Thank you very much. <coughs> I, I just want to share a couple of thoughts with you, somewhat randomly. I'm trying to give, give it a red thread. Um, you know, when, when I left the Swiss Guards uh, back in '88, uh, you get a last audience with, with the Holy Father. That, that you get into the room, and, and he knows that now is a guard. There's a guard coming in who who is uh, leaving. At the time, there were three of us, and so he's in the room, and we come in, and he's shocked, and he looks at me and says, "What?" What are you doing here? Where, where, are you, where are you going? I say, well, you know, Holy Father, I'm not getting any younger. I, I need to move on, you know, I, I'm leaving. And he got a big kick out of it. How old are you? 22 years old. 22 years old, you're getting, not, you're not getting older, you're getting younger. <laughs> and, you know, he was asking me, am I not good enough? Am I not good to you? Do you not like it here? And so on. And we had a nice laugh there. But then, you know, he took this very seriously and he said, look, uh, what are your plans? And I told them, and, and he said, now go and bring what you learned here into the world and into what you do at work. I was 22 years old, as I say, and, and that doesn't, didn't really mean that much to me, honestly. Um, I went then, and I, uh, I met my wife in, in Rome, who's American, and I went to America afterwards, and, and was very blessed with uh, being in, in a really great career. I, once I went to America and I studied there, I got in touch. I, I fell in with this company back in 89 who uh, brought TCP IP to the, P, to, the, to the computer, to the PC. So that is, they brought the internet protocol to the PC. Can you imagine what happened? I mean, you can all imagine what happened afterwards. We have the internet on the personal computer now. Um, and that was just a ride like you wouldn't believe. I went from, I started there as a non-paid intern uh, because the company was too small and they couldn't really afford to pay anybody for this. And so I, I, uh, yeah, I speak five languages, so they took me without asking, uh, without having any technical capabilities whatsoever. And within uh, two years, I was the vice president and I ran their European, uh, their international subsidiary. I moved to Europe eventually, we went public and all that. It was a, it was a, a drive up like you couldn't believe. And then I, 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 found, I left there eventually because you go, you go through the ups and downs. You see that this very system who gave me this, this free market capitalist system that gave me so much, that was such a blessing in a sense, also could be a curse. And, and I, I noticed that, that sometimes it went really well, sometimes it went really badly. I went to another company and helped them uh, as a startup. They, the company is called Dragon Systems. They do speech recognition. So you can talk to the computer and and it, it hopefully more or less understands what you're saying and it writes it down. You couldn't believe that right that this was again. I, I again ran all of the international stuff. We brought this to China, to Japan, where it was very useful to have speech more so than here, but also in Europe. We, we sold this all over the place. Sold it in 2000 um, and <coughs> for $600 million and find out, found out very quickly later that we actually sold this to a company who was fraudulent. So from one second to the next, my money went to zero. That's my love and hate relationship with capitalism. 
that on the one hand you see how good this is and how much I thrived in it, and on the other hand you see that there's something that sometimes doesn't work. And back then it was the Jubilee year and I saw John Paul often on TV and it reminded me, I, I was, I mean when you lose that much money you basically start to live under your desk. That's your instinct to basically just go away and not come back. And, but I, I listened and, and I had this grace to be able to listen to, the, to him and, and to start to understand um, that maybe I should look at the answer somewhere else. I did start uh, with a strategy company, a uh, business strategy company that focused on, on, on business strategy in uncertain environments, which is really what, I'm, uh, what I think I'm best at. Uh, but even there, I found some, some frameworks and things like that, but I didn't find the answer. The answer came from him, eventually, and from my faith, that what makes a system work is not the system itself. It's the person. There is no company who makes any decisions. There's only individuals who make decisions. A company doesn't have any virtues. There's only virtues that persons have. Because there's always somebody who makes a decision. I started to uh, work a lot in, uh, b because of my business in, in Africa and in emerging markets and because I did this business strategy stuff. And I started to get to know a lot about uh, and work with all these aid organizations and foreign aid <coughs> And I thought maybe there, maybe that's where the virtue uh, thrives and where things are all well. And I was sorely disappointed, even more so than I was in the actual capitalist in the business world. That you see, when poverty becomes your business, more, business, more poverty is more business. That's the absurdity of our aid system. And you're seeing that just because you're going into a nonprofit doesn't mean that, the, that you're leaving your general culture of selfishness, nihilism, and, and, and uh, relativism behind. Those same people with the same values are in government, in NGOs, and in business. So when we want to fix something, we shouldn't uh, try to say, well, we all need to move into NGOs or non nonprofits. We should talk about our personal values and our personal virtue. When we then, just quickly, on, on when we then deal with poverty, again, it was John Paul who, who, gave, who gave me this brilliant idea where he would say, you see, today we measure poverty as X dollars a day. What is it, 250 a day, $3, pick your, pick, your, pick your number. He says, that's very demeaning. I don't want to be measured on $3 a day. That's a demeaning way. And most of all, there comes the philosopher out of him. He says, you see, you be very careful when you're looking at a, a solving a, a problem, finding a solution, spend most of the time at defining the problem. Because how you define the problem leads to the solution. And so he says, let's stop calling the poverty X dollars a day. The definition of poverty, in his opinion, is the state of being excluded from networks of productivity and exchange. Let me say that again, because it's one of the best definitions I've ever heard. Being poor is to be excluded from networks of, of productivity and exchange. This, in a way, encapsulates everything that Hernando says about rule of law and uh, having, being in a network where you're being recognized that this is yours and this is somebody else's. If you use, if we all use that definition of poverty, I think our solutions become much more obvious. Uh, two quick last points. To, to, to visualize this, uh, what's, uh, th this issue with poverty and these networks of productivity and exchange, Africa as a continent constitutes 12% of humanity, as far as people are concerned. They receive 29% of all the aid that is spent in the world. And they only receive 1.4% of all foreign direct investment. That's what's wrong. I would like to stress that as we, as we look at solutions, that we should, we're bunching poverty into one problem, but it isn't. I wouldn't even say that poverty is a problem. The problem is how do we create wealth, that's it. That poverty itself is not the problem. It's, uh, we, we, we need to be able to create prosperity. But there's two issues here and two different ways to approach. The one thing is we need to talk about humanitarian crisis. That is the Christian non-negotiable, non even the humanitarian non-negotiable, 
the, the human is non-negotiable to say, if somebody is hurting and is dying because there was a tsunami or an earthquake or something, what we need to do is go there, take over, and feed this person. When we're talking about, so that's one thing. The other thing, which is most of what we're talking about, is economic development. There, you shouldn't react by going there and giving the person everything. There, you should react by being, having solidarity with the person, by helping them help themselves. You know, that's like the old adage of teaching a man to fish. We should do that over there. But we often treat economic development as if it was humanitarian aid by just providing, by creating a culture of dependence, and by violating these people's dignity of almost treating them. This is my issue with fair trade things like this. This is almost like the Special Olympics of saying, you know what, you can't really cut it in the real market. Go, go over here. You know, you have a special, there's a special class for you. No, there isn't. They have just as much dignity and much brain as I do. I've met some of the best entrepreneurs I've ever met in Africa, in South America, in Southeast Asia. What they need is our engagement and our solidarity. So let me end with two questions. We talk about what can you do? Well, let me ask you, when you buy something every day, do you act in solidarity? Do you vote with your vo wallet? Or you, do you abdicate this responsibility of saying to your government or to, to some institution, oh, why don't you worry about the, what happens in Africa? And why don't you tell these companies what to do with rules and regulations? Because you're too lazy to make your own rules and regulations for your own life and saying, I'm not buying this and I'm putting my money here. By the way, let's look at your investment portfolio. Does your investment portfolio reflect your values? Or are you one person in your investment portfolio and another person, uh, you know, on Sunday? Because what really, ha what really matters in ha helping to eradicate poverty is not having a heart for the poor, but having a mind for the poor. Even the very last sentence was provoking, I'm quite sure. Thank you very much, Andreas. Richard? Thank you. Thank you all for listening to us. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for caring. Uh, the question, however, will be what do we actually do? Because when we leave here, there will be many money opportunities for us to do things. I'd like to open with a quote from uh, one of my favorite authors. I'm not a diehard capitalist. I do not view capitalism as a credo. Much more important to me are freedom, compassion for the poor, respect for the social contract, and equal opportunity. But for the moment, to achieve these goals, capitalism is the only game in town. It's the only system we know that provides us with the tools required to create massive surplus value. Thank you, Dr. DeSoto, for your kind words. Um, and I think that that is actually a much better description rather than to talk about development. The Carpenters Fund uh, is a result of my decision uh, in uh, 2007, that the, that the world economic system was very flawed and I needed to leave it. So I walked away from the fund family that we had built of over $4 billion of senior bank loans, collateralized bank loans, and uh, moved into the Carpenters Fund. The Carpenters Fund is, is designed to alleviate poverty. Now, you can never eliminate poverty, but you can alleviate many parts of it. We're talking about real things. We're talking about, and uh, at the risk of, of, of depersonalizing, uh, there are three billion people in this planet, and they do live on less, three dollars a day or less. And they don't live very well, they don't live very long, and it's not very happy. But it is true, so let me set that out there. It is depersonalizing, as uh, my partner said, to refer to them that way. But let me get back to the human part of it. I had a conversation in a taxi cab in Phoenix with a young man who was driving, and he picked up a cell phone and started jabbering. And I had studied enough Kiswahili to understand that he was a Nigerian. And when he would finish his call, I said, well, uh, what is your name? He said, oh, my name is Mohammed." I said, well, Mohammed, I wanted to tell you that uh, we are uh, drilling for water 
for people in your country to alleviate poverty. And he said, oh, and I handed him my card for the carpenter's fund. He looked at it, and the T in my card is a superscript. And he said, oh, isn't that the cross in carpenter? I said, yes, it is. He said, well, are, are you a Christian? I said, yes, I am, uh, Muhammad. He said, well, I'm a Muslim. I said, yes, actually, Muhammad, I had figured that out already. <laughs> uh, he said, well, would you come to my village in, in Kenya, and would you drill for water for us? I said, of course I would. And he said, but, but we're Muslim. I said, yes, I know that. And he said, well, but, but we're Muslim. And I, I said, Muhammad, are you human? And he said, yes, I'm human. I said, well, good, so am I. I'm human too. Now, on the basis that we're both humans, let's talk about it. He said, well, you can become the king of Kenya if you can bring us water. I said, Muhammad, I don't want to be the king. I work for the king. I'm not the king. And on those two things, I will bring you water. So <clears throat> the, the goal of, of Carpenter's Fund is to create a fund which is really a bank. The problem in, the, in funding of enterprises to alleviate poverty all over the emerging countries is that the banking system is broken. And the banking system won't go. As a matter of fact, when uh, I first met Andreas, uh, he said, I asked him, how, so how are you doing on this project of creating sustainable businesses? He said, well, I'm not doing very well. I said, why not? He said, well, the banks. I said, sure. You went to these banks. I named four of them. I said, and they all told you no, yes. And he said, yes, they told me no. I said, well, no, I'm telling you yes. Yes, because we're the guys to say yes to creating the capital and transferring it from the first world, the, the, the developed countries, if you will, because we can do this. We can make a difference. We can do transformative, sustainable development. We can build little businesses. So I want to talk about one specific little thing we did. Because in the middle of this room is a th our 300 or 3 billion, I say 3 billion elephants. And they're the elephants that are not being served. And we're not respecting their humanity. We're not serving their needs. And they are dying. And as the world economy gets worse, and I certainly agree with Dr. Soto that it is getting worse, um, those who were living on $3 a day next year will be living on $2 a day purchasing power adjusted because the dollar just lost 30% of its value. By design, by the way, I might add. Um, creating wealth by investment. That's really what we're about. The Carpenters Fund has come to build wealth. And one of the elemental wealth is water. Think about it. You can live three minutes without air. You can live maybe three days without water. And perhaps at the equator, you need three liters of water a day. And you can live maybe three weeks without food. But our life is dependent upon real things, air, water, food. So let me talk just about water. It's simple, very simple. Water is in most places, but it's not obtainable. It requires capital, requires capital equipment, requires knowledge. And to be extracted and made usable, it's very difficult especially if you have no capital. So <clears throat> the, uh, one, of the, one of the stories of, uh, of Jesus uh, with the Samaritan woman, said she described to him that our father Abraham dug these wells, and that wealth has carried on through the years. So she was there as an outcast, as a woman. So now we have the issues of, of, of water, of wealth, of gender equity, uh, and we have the issues of political division, of religious division, and yet water is central. It's central to life. Can we bring water, a very simple thing, to people, for example, in the Horn of Africa, where we are doing the very same thing, in Tanzania, we are, through a subsidiary, the largest water driller in the nation, and we didn't exist 10 years ago. We decided to do something, and we decided to do something through capital, to transfer our capital into productive things, and it's sustainable. It's cash flow positive, it's paying its debt, it's employing people. And that's a very simple thing. We're going to take a break, we'll drink coffee, we'll drink water, but 
our women did not walk 10 kilometers on average each way to bring 10 gallons of water to the village because the village I'm talking about has a well. I know. I was there. I filled it. And that's what's exciting. The exciting thing is we can actually do these things. We hear. You don't have to theorize about it. You don't have to say, well, theoretically, I understand that these people are there. I understand that there are famines. I understand people have to go fetch water for the men. They, these are all great issues. Okay, so what are we doing about it? Well, we're creating wealth. We're creating wealth through investment, through, and we are the senior creditor. We require two to one collateral. Collateral, a big issue. Dr. DeSoto has talked about at length. Uh, we require two to one interest coverage. So this is a business proposition. If the, if the system fails, we will take the collateral and adjust it to another use. It's very hard to tell someone that, that you're going to have to take the collateral back. So our actual biggest problem is not to overloan, because in fact, that's what's wrong with the world today, is that the, that the, emerge, that the developed countries have overborrowed and others have overloaned. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> what, I, what I want to bring here is a message of hope. The hope is that we in the developed countries have the means, we have the knowledge, and we have the capital. The question is, do we have the will? Do we truly feel the need? Do we truly want to change the world? Or do we just want to ignore it and talk in platitudes and talk in, in uh, academic jargon? You ask me, said one of the books I read, if I'm my brother's keeper, and I say, no, I'm my brother's brother, my sister's brother. And that's the message I want to leave with you. The message of hope, the message of being our brother, and of bringing to those who cannot bring to themselves the capital, the knowledge, the will, the compassion, the love, and the success that we enjoy and give as a free gift. We've talked a lot about servant leadership, and that quote is in the book of Mark and the book of Matthew, but we didn't talk about the rest of it. He came <clears throat> not to be served, but to serve, and to be a ransom for many. The last part of the sentence never made it into the quote, and I understand why he shortened it, but we truly have the ability capital, the knowledge, and I hope the will to be a ransom for many who are in bondage to hunger, lack of water, lack of medical care, lack of education. And we have those. Are we willing to share? Truly, are we talking to our brothers and sisters? Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. With that, we're back to at least one of the fundamental questions that comes to our mind. Uh, what can we do? But more than that, what should I do? And um, a number of uh, thought-provoking uh, ideas and, uh, and experiences. I'm sure that the panelists would want to interact with each other, but uh, they uh, agree with me that, especially on this third day, it's good for all of you to be able to participate, and they will have an opportunity to interact with each other also. So you, yeah, you now will have an opportunity to make comments or ask questions on Hernando de Soto's address at the beginning and on the statements of uh, the other uh, panelists here. Um, and just for, for the panelists, the time we have here is, uh, well, 26 minutes, but this is only at the end of, of the panel before the Q&A. So we have the 25 minutes plus 15, in fact. Oh. So we have an, an, until 10.15. So that's, you're not seeing it, but we have here constantly the minutes coming down. So, uh, I, yes, I already see a number of hands. So, uh, and I know that there are several mics. Yes, please, could you, could, could you give the microphone there, please? Yes. All of you will have uh, an opportunity. So if we have an extra 15 minutes, let me make my question a little bit more clear than just two sentences. Um, 
the last photograph, because everybody knows me as professor at EBFL, but the last photograph I did for the newspapers in Beirut during the war was of a man burned alive. And uh, the father, Jamayel, had a fight with the newspaper saying, you can't show this. And I said, yes, you can, because you need to show the people. And this was my last photograph. So, Hernando, my question is very simple, very clear. I am trying to understand what's going on in economics. And I'm working with some people to see how we can tap into a system. Karl Marx was right how you can tap into this particularity of the system, which is 50 in paper and 500, this was my numbers, you say 700 today in just like, no one knows, off balance, it was invented here to save the system and it belongs to it, forget it. But my real question is, if I start listening to you and looking what's happening, there's one guy who burns himself in Tunisia. It's, I'm sorry, for him, for his parents, for everything that is around, this is huge. But in terms of what's going on in the Middle East or what's going on in the world, this is nothing. Absolutely nothing. So who took this event and leveraged on it to do what's going on? And thinking further and speaking with some friends, I was thinking, wait a minute. We had a Second World War. And what is going on today? Is, are they doing the third one? The players are the same. It's economical. Some guys are playing in North Africa. You know, that, you know, there was one guy called Rommel in the old days, down there, France, Germany. The southern countries in Europe are involved. We're touching the Mediterranean Sea. We're playing with Africa. And the Americans are just like doing their game and waiting a little bit. I don't want to enter politics, but do you think we can do a small parallel there, economically speaking? And this can be quite difficult because it, we're mixing two things, you know, the economy and the politics today. And this is the weapon that is in the hands of the, the economy. But do you think it's completely stupid to think about it this way and try to think who leveraged, because we're talking about economy, on this poor guy who burned himself? Because I, I can't believe this is only tweeting. You can't believe this is only, sorry, what? That just from the net and people spontaneously going in there and so on. You know, when you have an event that happens somewhere, okay, and it's taken and used, you need to know who's behind it. Maybe, maybe nobody, because nobody controls the whole thing, but it's very hard to believe. Another, with your permission, can, can we, since there are many questions, can I take three questions together and then sure. I'll, give, sure. uh, I'll give you the floor? I see, yes. I'm sorry, we have the spots in the eyes, it's difficult. Yes, you have the floor, good. Go ahead. Thank you. Sorry, Malika Sarabai. My question and comment is for Richard. For 50 years, the World Bank and IMF have been trying to help India and Indians by coming and profitably giving us things like dams, which are supposed to give us the means to sustain ourselves. Today, the American government is trying to help India by giving us nuclear plants, which are being shut down in most of Europe, so that in the next 20 years, India will have more nuclear plants and more machinery sold to help us. You are talking of water. Everybody knows that there isn't enough water, enough groundwater in the world for any kind of sustainability. Surely, rather than going and saying that for the benefit of the Africans, we are going to be drilling into what is going to consistently be falling groundwater levels, what is needed for a sustainable world is to go and to try and see how water can be harvested, how it can be saved, how small check dams can be built so that they are not destroying the very earth that is at peril 1.6 times what we need on what we have. To think that we, and I'm putting myself in the we because I belong to that elite which is considered to be Western educated, to think that we have the possibility of deciding 
what is profitable to us and is going to be good for the heathens, I think is, is way out of any of the discussions on humanizing or on sustainability. Thank you. So, so we'll take a third of you. You in the front here, you have the, the, the floor. But then, I mean, be, be assured that uh, all of uh, you who want to make a comment will have an opportunity to do so. So after this third question, we will go to the, to the panelists. You have the floor. Mike is not working. You got another one? Yes, thank you. Yeah, it, it's not the question. It's just a personal reaction on, on, on the presentation. The, the, the first point I want to, to, to mention is um, I worked during 30 years in a big French multinational companies, and I was working closely with the chairman of that company. Uh, um, it's a company with more than 8,500 people working all over the world. And I decided uh, some years ago to leave this organization to create my own organization because in the field of health, the gap between developed and developing countries is becoming bigger and bigger. And even if we have more fundings today, I would say we still cannot succeed in giving access to, the, to those people about healthcare issues. The second point I want to mention is, uh, for me, it's not anymore a question of developed and developing countries. I think that we are living in a world today where we have rich people everywhere and we have poor people everywhere. I just come back from India and I can assure you that in India, I met with people richest than the people we could have in Europe, in the US. And in my country, which is France, I see every winter poor people dying because they don't have any uh, conditions to live with. S the third point is um, uh, when we speak about those values, I can assure you that I saw smiling people, compassionate people, wisdom much more in developing world or emerging world than in our uh, developed world. The fourth point is coming back to the example that you take, Andreas, on, on Africa. Uh, and I, I know, and I met yesterday with some African countries, then don't take my remark as something against Africa. But you know the problem in Africa is today, I was in Burundi three months ago. You know, Burundi in 92, there was this civil war between the Hutus and the Tutsi. 80%, 80% of the international health which is given to Burundi didn't reach the final objective to cure, to cure the poor people. Then I think that would be my conclusion that today the global system from developing, from emerging world and developed world, and I will say even more, our world has to change in order to face the issue of common goods. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, can I please ask uh, Hernando to take Thank the question? Uh, I'm, I'm going to address the, uh, your first question about uh, the importance of somebody immolating themselves and what it has to do with, uh, with uh, the rest. Actually, I think the, uh, the issue here is the one of, the, of using a metaphor of understanding who are the people on the street. But let me tell you a little bit, I could have used the Tunisia, I could have used another country. As a matter of fact, you'll remember that originally in my speech I was going to talk about the Amazon. What was I going to talk to you about the Amazon? We have now, uh, the Amazon, by the way, be be begins in Peru, the longest tributaries, and then goes down to... Uh, to Brazil, it is uh, one of the richest areas in the world, ecologically speaking. It's uh, the biggest, uh, also the, the, the biggest lung that we have, and it's important to, to preserve it. But here's the, the situation. We've started having lots of revolts in Peru, indigenous revolts against companies, whether they're local, some of them are rich, and, and whether they're international, that have come in, and now with the prices of oil going up, all of a sudden we're finding <laughs> petrol all over the place. We're finding gas, we're finding gold, we're finding minerals, and lots of hydropower, of course, because all that water that comes down, uh, that, that comes down from the Andes. And uh, the problem there is essentially one of how do you avoid this violence, especially to take into consideration that it is, like in many other parts of the world, indigenous people or locals versus the multinationals or versus the large companies. And uh, of course, one of the question, one of the uh, one of the replies could be, well, what you have to do is maybe increase more aid. And the argument I'm trying to build up using different metaphors, and it's hard to, to bring it over, is that they actually have a capacity to do much more without any of the aid coming in from anywhere, should they be given the appropriate institutions. Let me give you an example. You're in the Amazon, and you've got 
a tribe that is not, that is next to uh, a, a concession that has been given to say an American firm. I could have used a European firm or a Chinese firm. Let's call it an American firm. Now that tribe, because of considerations that indigenous people are different from Western type people, Westernized Peruvians like myself, they can't have a property right that's transferable. What they have is a degree of sovereignty over land. Now, it just so happens that we have calculated that there's 1,500 of these tribes. But when we came in to actually count them, we found out that there were 5,000, and only in 5% of the cases of Peru are they actually titled in the sense that their border lines are known. Now, because they cannot use land as a guarantee, as collateral, as investment, as capital, they just simply have the land and it's poorly defined. The American company, on the other hand, because of its concession, has got a property right. So what it does with that property right is it inscribes it, first of all, in a bilateral investment treaty between Peru and the United States. It's called the BITS. Peru, like most developing countries, has bilateral treaties with different other developed countries so that you're not only relying on Peruvian law, but you're relying on foreign law to consolidate that property right. It then goes to the United States, now being a, a title that is guaranteed by both Peruvian American law and, and American law, and gets guaranteed by OPIC, Overseas Private Investment Corporation. And once it does that, it also gets inscribed in the World Bank under MIGA, Multilateral Investment Guarantee Program, whereby the Peruvian title became a super duper duper triple duper title. I mean, it's so solid that it cannot even be contested by the Peruvian parliament. Then the person who's organized all of this, a very smart businessman, then goes to the capital markets, whether it's New York, whether it's Toronto, whether it's London, and says, have I got a beautiful thing for you. Can you imagine a piece of land that may have oil in it, that looks like it may have gold in it, but that even President Obama can't touch? Because President Obama, because of eminent domain, could expropriate you in the United States, but you can't in a developing country. And against that potential raises $3 billion. Now here's a question. Who really has the capital? Is it the North or is it the South? Who's got the property title? Because at the end, capital is always created and the money is issued or the private paper is issued against some kind of a guarantee. And that guarantee takes places on our resources. What would happen if our indigenous people, instead of simply depending on aid, simply were allowed to become capitalists and own their stuff and decide by themselves? Now, it's a big decision. You either trust them or you think they're poor Indians that can't think for themselves. But this is the only way you're only going to find, this is the only way you're going to build capital. As a result of what we did in Peru, we were immediately contacted and given a contract in the Niger Delta. You go to Nigeria, the Niger Delta is where about 30% of the oil is found in Nigeria. When you go in there, you wonder why they're calling you because people read you and read you for different reasons and interpret in different ways. And thank you so much for your, uh, for your interpretation there, Dick. Uh, what happens is when you land there at the airport itself, it says, welcome to the Niger Delta. Population between 15 and 30 million inhabitants. You don't know, okay? But it's the same thing as Peru. And because the indigenous people can't get a property right on their oil or their natural resources, they go to another business, which is called the informal sector plus plus, and that's called being a pirate. And so they debunk the oil, they take it whichever way they can, and they feel they have a legitimate right to it. And you're never going to find out if there are 15 or the 30 million people until you have property. Because nobody's going to be willing to give you the information if they exist, unless to governments that have never been trusted throughout the world, you, they give you something in exchange. The reason we are able to build statistics in developing countries is because we give them property in exchange for the information. If you tell somebody, I happen to be working for the Peruvian government or the Nigerian government, I'd like to know where you live, how old you are, how much money you've got, you don't have, are you married, are you married once, twice, three times, how many homes do you have? I need to know all of that because how else can I govern you? And the reply will, if you ask me, I will say I'm Pedro, I'm, my second name is Sanchez, and I live in Cusco. I'll tell you every lie because I think you're going to tax me. But if I come around and say, I'm going to give you a right to your oil, if you find oil, I'm going to give you a right to your gems, if you find gems, I'm going to give you a right to your forest if you find forest. Now give me your name, and I'll say Hernando de Soto, Peruvian, Lima. I'll give you all the information you want to. The objective of property and putting your institutions in place, what you Europeans did throughout the 19th century, is you created identity. 
you created a system which I feel, in many cases, you take for granted. You really do. There's too many books like Samuel Huntington, uh, may he rest in peace, that essentially are all about why Anglo-Saxons are superior to the rest of us. Well, the reason you are superior to the rest of us is that you've got good institutions. So to me, to get the common good going, you actually need what Europe was most successful at, is creating the institutions. And the objective of putting in my speech today a man who incinerated himself at the beginning is to ask why could anybody decide to do that? And every interview we come to is that the frustration is essentially the frustration of an entrepreneur, of someone who wants to get along, who may have also been a good employee, but still can't get anything to do with it, and they all have land problems, and they all have the problems of identity within a business circle and the problems of not getting credit. It can get that anguishing. All I wanted to do was bring it down to a, uh, to, to a human term, so we identified it also with a crisis that you're going to have just south of here in the Mediterranean, that if it is not identified as clearly as being an economic problem, can easily be kidnapped by politicians. This is what happens with entrepreneurial crisis in my country. If you do not respond to them with entrepreneurial means, giving them the property rights, giving them the tools, the credit with which to actually build by themselves, it will be turned around the same way the revolution of 1917 in Russia was turned around, the way, same way 1789 in France was turned around, and it'll become political instead of becoming a good old pragmatical way of empowering people through economic and legal means. So thought provoking. Thank you very much. Even though Even though I, I would like to say that definitely one of the next topics for our meetings here in Zermatt would be and should be to redefine the relationship between the economy and the, and the political world and, 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 uh, and society. Because, I mean, there has been in the uh, past uh, years and decades a developing, growing image that uh, the, it's not what you said, but that the state is the enemy and, uh, and, uh, and um, everything goes through uh, ec economics. And obviously, I fully support what has been said, and, uh, and the evolution should not be um, hijacked by uh, corrupt politicians that, that would, uh, you know, in, in a way, um, make what you said about the French uh, Revolution and, and, uh, and the Russian Revolution, uh, etc. Definitely, but this is not the, the, the topic for, for this morning, and there are a number of questions, but I would like uh, Richard to have an opportunity to respond, and if Andreas uh, also wants to add anything, he is welcome. But then I would want to give back the floor to the audience as soon as possible. So, Richard. Yes, Malika, for your, uh, <coughs> for your question. Um, thank you very much for, for talking about the nuclear power plants, the equipment from the governments, and so on. I, I, I'm really not prepared to address any of that. I'm not a critique of the NGOs or of the World Bank or of world policy. I'm, I'm very directly saying that what we can do is to intervene and we can bring water to African villages and, in fact, are doing that. I, I don't think what you were intending to say was that we should not do that. I have seen the joy on the, on the faces of 5,000 people who had no water within 10 kilometers. And I've seen the joy of, of school children attending school where the, now they could finally flush the toilets in, uh, in Upper Tanzania. But what I can tell you is, however, uh, direct a really personal thing uh, on one of the board meetings where I was a board member and we, we were in the Rusha of Tanzania, uh, we had spent the, the week uh, visiting each of the drill sites and, drill, and, and the, the reasons we're doing the nitty-gritty things, hydrology, transportation, mechanical breakdowns, all of the real serious things that involve the business. This is what entrepreneurs do. They make it work. And Joshua, who was one of our guides, who was trying to better himself, said to me and privately, he got me aside and said, that, uh, please, he said, first of all, thank you for what you've done in helping to bring water to us. Thank you for coming to my country. But please, don't give us anything except what we need to develop ourselves as you have done. And I can't make any more water in the world, and I can't ordain how water should be saved or not. I, that's, that's beyond my purview, way beyond my pay grade. What I can tell you is, 
that we can make very serious changes in the lives. And we have to decide whether these people are our brothers and sisters or they're not. We, that's the true meaning of solidarity. Can you, do you, now that you know, and now that you see it, what are you going to do? And all I can tell you is what I did. Thank you very much. Microphone uh, there. Yes, I see hands, but I, I mean, the light is too strong here. I don't see. Yes, you have the floor, sir. Yeah, I have uh, two questions to Mr. Could, could De Soto. Please, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, Martin Wilde, Association of Catholic Entrepreneurs from Germany and Uniapak Europe. Um, Mr. De Soto, you have uh, very well analyzed that in many African countries or developing countries, you have this lack of. A solid institution. You have also analyzed that in the Western world, in the financial markets, we are risking to, to lose uh, what has made us strong. Um, but if you could highlight a little bit how we get there to fix the problems. Let me take Nigeria, where I have been working for a couple of years, um, to bring good institutions or to help Nigerians to build strong, reliable, common good oriented institutions. It's a very, very huge uh, task, and if you are touching certain privileges, you are even risking your life. And uh, if you want to bring sanity to the global financial system, I am not sure whether you would not risk the same at a given point. So, what? How? How do we get there? Thank you. Thank you very much. Could you? Yeah, sir. Please. Thank you. I think I hope this does not look like a complot because I am a colleague of Martin Weil, also belonging to UNEPAC, Eduardo Aninat. And first, I want to congratulate the panel. <coughs> I think the free insights have been clear, decisive, and in the sense of development and value, which is all what the conference is all about. And I want to first uh, give a little homage to Hernando, my friend and colleague from Latin America. Many encounters in the past, and uh, to his um, honor, recall that about three and a half years ago in a small city of Spain called Malaga, uh, we had the honor of sharing a panel together, and he was already alerting about the issue of entitlements, property rights, and the problems of the street vendors and the poor people in Egypt, in Cairo, where he was doing some work. And this shows the insights and the capacity of his work in the things we are dealing with today in the modern world. And now to challenge him, because we don't uh, ask soft questions to people who have brilliant minds, on the contrary. <laughs> so Richard has quoted his uh, good book, The Mystery of Capital. Most of us have read it. But I wonder, uh, Hernando, what is your next book going to deal about? Because in a way, and I speak here from a development economist point of view, uh, having done lots of work in past years about that and continuing to do it now in a different, more meaningful way perhaps, your theories, your applications, your good work, and I started with that, could look a little bit as a one-sided model. That is to say, Entitlements, registration, property rights, the role of that in the informal economy now becoming formal, identity, and the issue of uh, recognizing and keeping these property issues so that people can start. But my question is, what is next? After all, if I can challenge you, property is important, titles and identity is important, but it's a stock. How do you view now the movement forward, the flow, the other? things that have to be put into your equation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could you please show me where the bikes are? Okay, I see one here and one there. So the, the two of you will have the floor, please. Um, I'm Jose Maria Simone from Argentina. This is a coincidence. I also belong to UNIAPAC. So, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I didn't know this was the order. Um, my concern is, the following, um, we were <coughs> during the morning discussing 
and introduce the concepts of the evolution and needs of uh, the society. But it was really very important that Hernando de Soto started saying, I'm talking about a person. And everything started to go and to grow, going from that example. And we tend, in this time, type of summits, then to provoke and to say, let's start talking about the economic uh, uh, groups or political groups to discuss about these, these things. I'm a business manager. I'm very practical. Please, in the next summit we discuss, don't lose the focus. We are talking about persons. Let's talk about pragmatic ways of solving, not start thinking and discuss about the maybe issues. Sorry for this uh, saying in this crude way. I don't want to go back again to the brutal logic of business. I want to go back again to do business to serve a person. And this is my recommendation. If we bring here experts in politics, experts in, uh, in, in economics, and business managers, let's think that the end of that process is a person. And let's put the mindset to think and discuss in that aspect. Don't start again thinking how we are going to um, solve the problems, introducing new concepts, new ways, things that cannot be done in, in a very pragmatic way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Guido Palazzo, I have a question for Hernando de Soto as well. I agree with your analysis of uh, the, the importance of property rights, but there's a dark side of the force. Um, the whole neoliberal philosophy has in its core property rights and the um, protection of property rights at any price over all the other stakeholder rights. So how do you see this tension between the promotion of property rights and the avoidance of falling into the trap of having even more neoliberalism. Thank you. We'll, we'll stop at that for the, for the questions and we'll have another one around later on. So let's take these four questions. Well, let me start uh, uh, by asking the, uh, by, by addressing the question from a friend from uh, Germany. I think that the West built a framework over time, which is the one that has given us the the enormous uh, prosperity we have uh, shared around the world, some more than others, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be in the problems we are. Uh, we haven't beat the problem of concentration of wealth or the problem of exclusion, as, uh, as, uh, as has been defined here by my panel members. But essentially, the world has uh, grown more in the last 50 years than it has in the previous 2,000 years. So something was done well. The question is, how can we do it better? And how can we make it more inclusive? And the real issue, of course, happens to be one of the issues is, how do you practically get these things into place? And then if you go back to finding out where these things originated, for example, in the case of Germany, uh, the notion of the rule of law, and a rule of law that gave citizens not only control over assets, whether they be land and other things, but also gave them the means to organize those assets, which are enterprises. I mean, we were talking about before that citizens have the right to a family, they have a right to religion, they have a right to political groupings. What Europeans and Americans gave their people over the 19th century was the right to also organize yourself economically. And that's the corporation, and that is the business entity. It gives you limited liability. It allows you at least to define your liability. It gives you a structure that is different from that of the family. It gives you the right to issue shares, which is a property right, against an investment, which, for example, none of our indigenous people have. So you can't even make them shareholders if you want to. There's a lot of oil companies. There's a lot of mining companies that would that love avoiding all the problems that they actually end up facing by just making indigenous tribes shareholders. But an indigenous tribe is essentially a political organization. It's not a business organization. So you actually need to add that as another element 
of the many ways that human beings have of getting organized. Now, how did this come in the, in the case of Germany? Well, one of the things that Luther began uh, over about, uh, uh, I don't know, a few hundred years ago was, as a matter of fact, the right to start giving farmers a piece of land. And they weren't actually given title. It took the defeat of the Prussian army at the hands of Napoleon in 1806 and the fact that the Prussian army was not able to recruit uh, officers and was not able to recruit troops to, for the reforms to take place for people to start being issued titles. And that's when the Stein Hardenbergs re began and the Grun book system began. And it's a little bit like a German jurist uh, called, I think, Gerendorf, von Gerendorf said, law and the institutional reforms of Europe and the United States were not born out of a desk. They were born in friction. When you have friction, when you have a crisis, that is the moment that you come in. And if I mentioned Boisizi, and I mentioned the troubles we have in the Amazon, and I mentioned the Niger Delta, and, I'm, and I can measure the Naxalite movement in India, and I can actually probably mention to you an internal conflict in every developing country in the world, it is essentially a conflict between people about territory, about water, about other natural resources, and that translates to me as property rights. It is a way, if you want to, I can take all of that away and say no. It is a problem of sovereignty because it also means that tribes have got to decide on what legislation they want. But at the end, they also control and have personal assets that they want to be able to dominate through law. So the, the question is, how do you begin? You begin when it is clear that the crisis has to do with the rule of law and you can identify it with a national cause. Because the problem about using language or Western language is that the moment that you say property rights, you're immediately identified in the West as a neoliberal. So for example, in Peru, we don't use property rights. We talk about control, control de recursos. And that says it all. And you can have private control. We can have communal control. I really don't care. I just want the indefinition to go so that people can contract in peace and decide how they're going to develop their resources or whether they're not going to develop their resources. Now, what's the next book going to be on? Right. The next book, as a matter of fact, is in a way slightly summarized in a, an article I wrote, uh, a feature article I wrote, a cover article I wrote in Bloomberg Business Week a month ago called The Destruction of Economic Facts. And it essentially says that I feel that the West actually developed the fact. If you look at a dictionary back in the 19th century, a fact was something that happened, an occurrence, algo que ocurrió, we would say in Spanish. That's what it was. But today, a fact is something that is a proposition written in standardized terms that is bound by rules that can be tested for truth, that can be verified and be certified. So if today you say, I have, I'm a fact, you know, it is the fact that I'm the son of Alberto, maybe yes, maybe yes, maybe no, but if I've got the documents, definitely so. So the West found a way to actually be able to determine who you're actually dealing with. When you go to the informal sectors of any South American or African economy, you don't know who you're dealing with. I mean, I mentioned Niger Delta, between 15 and 30 million inhabitants. I mean, you don't really know even how many people there are there. Talking to President Obasanjo, I remember, of Nigeria about maybe a full 15 years ago, and I said, well, he was asking me how much we would build him to help him uh, formalize a Nigeria. I said, well, you have about, I think it was at that time, 120 million people, and he came back, 120 million, 180 million, somewhere there. It, it wasn't clear. So the thing is, getting facts is something the West did, and it did by creating public memory systems. It used accounting devices that were included in all firms, like the, the balance sheet, uh, obliging people to report that what they had in their balance sheets was actually the price on the market. They call it mark the market, and not simply an idea of what its potential value was, right? Uh, making sure that the records, if you buy or you sell land or you get mortgages, actually respond to the banks who own them and the people who hold the real final, the, the real final uh, control over the asset wherever it is, it's facts. So the result is that the West has been able not only to create public liquidity, which of course you know better than us, after all your work in the IMF, public liquidity comes from government, it's government backed. 
But what they've actually created is private liquidity. All of these derivative systems, all of these credit default systems, all of these mortgage systems are really the creation of private money. Now the question is, what anchors private money? Essentially, it is a well-defined fact that on paper tells you that behind this derivative, there is a commitment and a contract behind which there is a house and a piece of land. Or there's an idea, and that's a patent. Or there's a property right over, uh, uh, over, a, uh, over a play or over a movie script. Now, what happens when all of a sudden the West gradually starts disassembling this without knowing or without being absolutely conscious over the last 15 years. Over the last 15 years, you go to the banks, whichever bank you're going to, especially if you've got a European bank and if you've got an American bank and they don't have one balance sheet statement, as I said before. They may have two, they may have three, they may have four. You could go to them and then you say, is this your balance sheet? Yes, this is the good bank, but there's also the bad bank, which I put all my debts in. All of a sudden, what you're finding in the West is you're not getting the facts. And what you're now starting to find out is that as the, Christ loom, as the crisis grows, and first of all, the Greeks get into the crisis, the, uh, the Poles, the Irish, etc., they can't even agree among themselves how much the debt is and how much actually uh, of the debt is hidden in repo markets. And then one of the problems, of course, with, with the Lehman Brothers is you weren't able to really find out the debt even until today because it's hidden in markets where there is no recordation, which means there are no facts. So in other words, the, idea, the, the general idea behind this is that the crisis is really about a knowledge crisis. The big issues among uh, economists, all the way from Adam Smith through Marx and all the way to Alfred Marshall, was how is it that in this enormous world of seven billion people that we are today, we are never, nevertheless now able to do something we weren't able to do 200 years ago, which is trade with people we've never met, with companies we've never seen, once in a while, of course, running the risk of meeting a fraudulent one. But let me tell you, in the informal economy, they're all fraudulent. At least you get them once in a while. Well, you can actually identify people, and the question is, where is the knowledge? And the knowledge is in a very boring place, and it's called public memory systems. It is that the West has kept literally a record of everything. And somehow or other, you can locate things and you are able from those things to infer. And what I'm saying is that in the last 15 years, as finance has trumped the real economy and for the purpose of actually facilitating transactions, lots of transactions are no longer recorded, lots of values are no longer recorded, or when they're recorded, they're recording according to expectations or they're made by rating firms that actually don't have a stake in the business. But what these rating firms have is an opinion, and an opinion is not the truth. In other words, one of the things that the West had achieved in the last 150 years is to get closer to the truth. And now you do not longer pick up a Western piece of paper and know that it's the truth. The reason you're keeping your money in your bank so far is because you know that the Swiss government is behind you. And in the United States, it's because you know that Ben Bernanke will go from quantitative easing two to quantitative easing three. And you know that the day he stops, you're going to be in real trouble. And you know that the reason we're getting all that funny money that we're getting in Latin America from China and from the West, buying up loads of mines and buying up loads of natural resources and loads of forestry isn't so much because we're blooming, it's because you've got nowhere else to put that money because your assets are very uncertain as opposed to our assets today. And that is the cause of many of the coming conflicts. And what worries me, of course, to a great extent is that one of the arguments we at least had in the past was that the Western systems were booming and we could always say, you've got success. So even if they're not adaptable to third world countries, at least you've got success. And it's a system that allows you to make progress and there's no reason why it cannot be adapted to the developing country because if you have the argument that, look, it's not Latin American. I mean, this is a typical argument in Peru. We're just not made for capitalism. They're made for soccer, for football, pornography. They're made for everything, but they're not made for capitalism, right? As if something ethnic in you wasn't made for that. Now, with the collapsing of the system, as it will come, 
And we're getting always, obviously, we feel it closer and closer all the time as countries start breaking, especially as we don't find that we have replies. I'm very concerned, and that's why I brought the Bouazizi thing. You know, you're trying to put everything into 18 minutes, you're not always successful. But the Bouazizi thing to me means that at a time when the uh, Mediterranean countries could, or the Muslim countries could find an inspiration in business, and they were great at it 700 years ago. I mean, the check was invented in, in Arab countries. It was called the sec. You could draw a check on Damascus and uh, have it paid in, uh, in Shanghai. All of a sudden, when you're going to look towards the West, as the crisis develops, the West isn't going to be such a neat example. And it is essentially because we've destroyed the art of having precise information, which is called the fact, and I'm trying to define with exactitude what a fact is. That's what the book is on. So I can take it one step further, I think. <laughs> well, with, with that, uh, I know that I've made false promises in the sense that I really truly believe that with 45 minutes discussion, we could uh, give you the floor I mean, to, to all of you. Now I know that we have just uh, one minute to go, and uh, I'm just uh, responsible for, for keeping the, uh, the time frame. So, um, Christopher, you want to admit? Yes, definitely. I, I want to, to give both um, uh, Andres and, and Richard an opportunity to make a concluding remark if they, if they so, uh, so wish. Yes, please. Yes, Andres. In conclusion, I just want to say that it's very impressive what you're doing in Nando, and, and as usual, I, I admire what you do. Let's not, I think we can all, the, the fear is now palpable, isn't it? Um, and I'm not sure that's 100% helpful because fear paralyzes and we want to do something here. The, the, the goal of today is what we're going to do. And uh, that's the same with the environmental issues and, and the real, uh, you know, the freight train running into the, into the brick wall that you're describing here. That sort of has a tendency of just saying, you know what, c'est la vie, uh, we're just gonna, let's just have a glass of wine now. Um, but that's not, that's not really what, what I think we should do. What we should do is to look forward and say, what can we do? And not look, again, not to abdicate our responsibility to act. And we, and I think, uh, you know, one little drop into, a, into the sea um, could change, the ripple of that could change the whole sea and the whole world. And I think that's what I'd like to focus on today. Um, even smaller issues then, you know, for solving this, what you're describing, is such an undertaking that it's, it looks like it's unsurmountable. But we, as individuals, can do things every day, every minute, that have an effect, that cumulatively can solve these issues. And again, what, what we're doing and what didn't come uh, through all the way with the Carpenters Fund is we're not, quote, just investing in water. We're investing in SMEs, small and medium-sized companies and investing is too much. We're doing these, these loans uh, to SMEs that can scale, that can produce, that can create jobs, that can create prosperity. SMEs are truly pioneers of prosperity, and that's where I think an opportunity exists to integrate them into our networks of productivity and exchange. Thank you very much, Andres and Richard. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to uh, end on a measure of hope because the little, oil, the little water company that I talked about is just a simple example. It employed 50 people. It was cash flow positive. It is going to go into the market and it is going to be owned by the indigenous people, the, the, the natives who work in it and who want to invest in water. But, and that brings me to the second point that we really didn't carry as well as we should have. And that is that the, the model of, of uh, giving, of charity, has its place, but we're now coming to a much more important uh, point in, in development where the model of investment is going to displace the model of charity because you're going to find, um, and we've, I've seen personal experience of uh, giving, uh, charitable giving off 40% in some cases, but you're gonna find that investment opportunities have become both uh, more available and lower prices. So I think what, we, what I'd like to leave with you very simply is we need to mobilize, to educate, and to enable investors to build enterprises which alleviate poverty globally. Thank you. <laughs>